Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. By the age of 26, Jason Gaynard had already built a million dollar business, but there was one tiny problem. It was completely draining his soul, and he hated every minute of it. So as a new husband and a father with a six-month-old daughter, he walked away. He was $250,000 in debt, had zero income, and no idea what to do with his life. The biggest question he needed to answer at the time was whether or not he should file for bankruptcy. Thankfully, within a few months, he found a new source of inspiration for his next venture. But how could you possibly start a new business when you're broke? Well, Jason joins us here today to share his story on how he risked everything and managed to build one of the largest and most respected events and mastermind groups in the world with members like Seth Godin, Tim Ferriss, Ramit Sethi, Gary Vaynerchuk, and many more. This episode is filled with incredibly valuable lessons and insights that will serve you over the course of your lifetime. So please get ready to take some notes and please help me welcome Jason Gaynard. Well, Jason Gaynard, welcome to Self Made Man. It's fantastic to finally have you on the show. Thank you for having me, man. Huge fan of the show and huge fan of of the work that you do. So excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, one of the the things that I say quite often, in fact, people are are probably getting a little tired of hearing it, (laughs) is, you know, and I don't know if this is an epiphany I had or if I picked this up from somebody else years ago. All I know is that it's true. And that is the fact that there's only two ways to change any aspect of your life. If you don't like where you're at right now or the results you're getting, there's only two ways to change that. And that is by acquiring new information so that you can do things differently or by meeting new people. And meeting new people is a huge one because it opens new doors, creates new opportunities. And, uh, you know, it could be, you could be one individual phone call, email or introduction away from a radically different future. And you above all other people out there, are really the living personification of of these two rules uh, and how they have changed your life over the years. And for those who do not know your story, you've got an absolutely fantastic one. <laughs> and please dive into the nitty gritty little details because I think uh, I think you've got some gems in there, and we've actually have quite a few pieces of our stories in common. Bring people up to speed on on who you are and and how you got to be in the position that you're in. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, I agree wholeheartedly on the importance of, or I guess how people can shape your life. And for me, a lot of my relationships have have stemmed from events and attending events specifically. I went to an event in 2011 called Opening the Kimono, which was an event that uh, Tim Ferriss put on, which was an event geared towards authors who wanted to become best-selling authors. And although I never had the desire to ever become an author, it was $10,000 to go for two days. And at that price point, I felt like it would probably attract some really interesting people. And that was easily 20 times more than I've ever spent to go to an event. But I just had this gut feeling that I needed to go. And when the event was all said and done, I mean, truth be told, I didn't get the ROI, I guess you could say, initially because of, I mean, the content wasn't really applicable to me. But what has stemmed from those relationships, uh, I mean, from an ROI perspective, is, is nothing short of amazing. There's a, a saying uh, from Steve Jobs that uh, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You just need to trust that they'll somehow connect. And I've, I've taken that approach really to relationship building. A lot of times people won't invest in relationships because they can't peg an ROI to them. But now having heavily invested in relationships over the last five or six years, it's easy for me to connect the dots looking backwards. And I fundamentally believe it's one of the best investments you can make. But basically, my, I guess my story in a, in a nutshell was I dropped out of high school. I started a service-based business, and I realized that service-based businesses can be hard to scale. So I pivoted into an online product business, which I grew to about $7 million a year over four years with no outside investments. What, what was – you dive into detail for folks. What was that about? Sure, yeah. So that was a um, – so when we were a service-based business, we were in the – we were a personal concierge firm in essence. So we'd run errands for people. We'd do anything as long as it was legal, moral, and would save people time. And at the time, we were one of the first ones in the industry. And from a branding perspective or positioning perspective, when people thought of the word concierge, they thought of a hotel concierge. And when they thought of a hotel concierge, oftentimes they thought of concert tickets. So people started to come to us for for concert tickets. And we were sourcing our inventory through these 
big brokers and charging these who are charging these huge fees. So we decided to stock our own little inventory uh, to save our clients money. And time and time again, people get just kept on coming back until we reached a point where that side of the business eclipsed the surface uh, the the service side, and ultimately became like the second largest ticket wholesaler in Canada uh, a few years back. And uh, so that's how I got in that side of the business. But I think like most entrepreneurs, I was told to pick a business based on pro- proximity and opportunity. How can I make the most amount of money as quickly as possible? And unfortunately, I got to a point where after seven years of doing it that I realized I, I built a business I hated to enable me to buy things I didn't need to impress people I didn't like. And I felt like I was stuck on the hamster wheel. How, so, old, how old were you when you realized that? I was 26, 26, 27. Wow. That's a, that's a pretty young age to to come to that kind of a a mature realization, right? That's that's something most people, I think, would only <laughs> appreciate as they you know hit their thirties or not. But yeah, you're still in your in your twenties those days. That's impressive. Yeah, I was uh, rather young, I guess, to have a crisis of meaning. <laughs> right, <laughs> but right. uh, I'm I'm very glad I had it at that point in time. I mean, from a time perspective, I wish I had it a little earlier because when everything kind of hit the fan for me. You know, my daughter was six months old. I just got married. There was a lot of things in transition. Um, and there's a saying that when one door closes, another one opens, but it sucks to be stuck in the hallway. And that was a very dark hallway for me. Once I came to the conclusion that my heart was not in that business, ultimately, I decided that uh, I could sell it, but I would have to stay in the business for another year and a half, two years to transition it over to somebody else. And I just couldn't do it to myself. So I became comfortable with scaling that business down to zero. But unfortunately, two things happened that were beyond my control that, re- that really were the nail in the coffin that landed me a quarter million dollars in debt in August of 2012. So, yeah, I was left with no business, no cash flow, didn't know what I was going to do next. And as I may mention, I had a six year old, a six month old daughter, just got married. So uh, I was really trying to find my bearings, I guess you could say at the time. And then uh, somebody gave me a ticket to go see Seth Godin in New York. Basically, they posted it on Facebook, said that they had an extra ticket. I had no other obligations at the time, so I decided to take them up on this offer. Went to the workshop. I didn't even know what it was about, but it turns out the theme of it was a connection economy and how there's huge value connecting like-minded individuals. And at the time, I felt very isolated uh, as an entrepreneur, so I decided to come back and host these things called mastermind dinners, where I'd invite eight entrepreneurs out for dinner with the core focus of connecting them. And the first one I did, I almost canceled two hours prior because I'm like, nobody's going to see value in this. They're going to think I completely wasted their time. But thankfully, that first dinner turned out to be a big success. I mean, conversation didn't skip a beat for four and a half hours. And I got clarity that connecting people was something I wanted to do to some capacity for the rest of my life and not necessarily as a business because I wasn't actually monetizing these dinners. I was paying for them out of pocket. And, you know, I, I, I didn't know how I was going to make rent like the following month. But for me, I was pretty certain that I was going to have to declare bankruptcy. I didn't know what my rock bottom was, but I was pretty darn close <laughs> to it financially. Yeah. Wow. And uh, for me, I kept on doing these dinners because I guess the way I, I rationalized it was that the bank could take my car they could take whatever measly assets I had left, but they couldn't take my relationships. So taking whatever money I had left and investing in myself and investing in my relationships were two of the safest investments I could make. I continued on with these dinners. Then I had an opportunity to do an event with Tim Ferriss that kind of fell in my lap. There's a rather interesting story there that ties in relationships where Tim, who I met at his event a year prior in 2011, was coming out with a book called The 4-Hour Chef. And... A couple weeks before the book launched, he discovered that his book was going to be banned from all retail distribution. So Barnes and Noble, Walmart, everybody. And the reason for this is that the old, I guess, tr- traditional publishing model, and specifically uh, Barnes and Noble, the retailers, want to make an example out of Tim because he was the first big name author to publish through Amazon. And Amazon was just becoming too big in the publishing space. So they tried to make an example out of Tim, and Tim is by far one of the best book marketers and I know. And what he did was he created these book bundles that if you bought five books, you get additional resources. If you bought 25 books, maybe he'd, you know, do a webinar with you or something. Then he had this Hail Mary package that if you bought 4,000 books, he'd do two speaking engagements. And at the time, I thought of a friend of mine who runs these big events in Canada called The Art Of, because I'm like, you can easily move these books. He has thousands of people that show up to his event. And the minute I click send on that email, I say, you know what, this is a great opportunity for anybody because Tim's never spoken in Canada. He never speaks that much or doesn't speak that much at all. So I decided to email Tim directly and said, I'll take, I'll take the package. The downfall was I had to come up with $84,000 to buy 4,000 books in three days. Wow. And 
that was, I've never built a business, you know, raising money. I built them all on credit cards. So I had to overcome some kind of, you know, limiting beliefs of, of asking people for help because that's simply just not the way I was raised. And ultimately I called three people. The first person said, sounds interesting. Let's, let's talk numbers. And unfortunately I'm not a numbers thinker as an entrepreneur. And this is an industry that I had no experience in and a business idea that was only a few hours old. So I'm like, this probably is not going to work. I called the second person and said, let's start a business 50, 50 together. And that was, I was like, that sounds amazing. I have one more person to call. And then I called the third person and he said, you know what? Pick up a check from my office tomorrow morning. Didn't ask really about the business, the repayment. We didn't talk about repayment terms, none of that kind of stuff. And I didn't hesitate. I hung up that phone and the following morning I was, you know, I probably showed up to his, uh, his office an hour in advance, kind of just waiting outside. And yeah, I, I took that money, deposited it in the, the bank account, wired the money to Tim. And that's how we had Tim as the, uh, I guess, anchor speaker for our first Mastermind Talks event. So there was a moment where you're like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an event, right? And I'm going to charge money for that. And that's how I'm going to pay my rent, basically. So did that just kind of come out of the dinners? Was it, was it out of necessity or like, hey, I need to make some money. What do I, what do I have in front of me that I can turn into an opportunity? And is that just, we need to have an event? Well, if you speak to most people in the event space, you don't do events for money. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, that's, that's why I'm asking because it's Yeah, like, so and I, I didn't necessarily know, you know, again, because I had no experience in that industry. I didn't know, you know, the, the, the financial figures and the models behind it and that kind of stuff. But really how I saw it initially was that I could do what I do in these dinners on a larger scale. And if I could break even, then I just added, and we want to do a highly curated community, but if we, we we had 150 people in attendance, then I added 150 amazing people to my network. And to me, it was a social capital play. And also something to kind of keep me busy because when I was in that transition, I was kind of spiraling downwards into like depression and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things I realized is I wasn't focusing on anything in the future. So I'm like, this will enable me to focus on a project for the next five or six months. And then after that, I'll figure out what I want to do for, from a business perspective. So I never thought that this actually had legs. I just saw it as an opportunity to kind of keep me focused and to potentially add 100 or 150 amazing people to my peer group. Now, how did you get the first round of speakers to agree to hit the stage, right? That's, a, that's always a big ask for folks unless they're getting paid. Sure. Yeah. And obviously, you didn't have the cash to pay them. So how did you go about that? Yeah. So there was two kind of things that, that took place. So one was I had Tim as the initial speaker. And there's a, a principle in real estate called anchor tenants, where if you have a mall, like a flailing mall, you know, if you get like a Nordstrom's, it may bring in an Apple and a Macy's and other premium retailers. Mm. So the same thing, I took that same approach, I guess you could say with, with having Tim and mastermind talks where I knew if I had Tim, I could get people who want to, to connect with Tim to speak for free or people who are already friends with Tim, but they're never at the same place at the same time. So I could use that event as a catalyst to kind of reconnect him with all of his friends. And ultimately that worked. And I also, uh, I mean, to what you said, I mean, it's also one of the reasons why it's hard to make money in the event space is speaker fees, right? It's easy to spend two, three hundred thousand dollars on speaker fees. I didn't have any money. Uh, again, I was $250,000 in debt plus the 84,000 now before I even, you know, started to like plan this out. So what I did was I actually took, I guess, a, uh, a piece of uh, Peter Diamond Peter Diamandis's playbook with the X Prize, where I created a prize for the best talk is voted by the audience. So we did a twenty five thousand dollar prize, and that model worked exceptionally well for us. Um, you know, I it just we had people who charged thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar keynote fees come to compete for an award. Ultimately, they didn't care so much about the money. So that's how we kind of slowly we built the event or the speaker roster around Tim, and then also had that speaker prize in play. Nice, nice, nice. So let's talk a, a little bit about social dynamics when it comes to meeting important people, right? And, you know, this, I guess, all comes down to status and how status is perceived and how it's used, you know, within, within social groups. And for the most part, everybody has their own perceived level of, of status about themselves. And individuals have it, you know, about you also, their opinion of it. Sure. And if you're on the, if you perceive each other to be on the same level of status, you're kind of like peers, your colleagues, you're, you're, you know, you're great. If there's a different level of status, then, you know, if you're approached by someone who's maybe just getting started, doesn't have a lot of 
you know, maybe equity to offer you and they want to start a conversation and take up your time. Well, now that becomes a liability, right? And this is something that I thought was really interesting uh, it was as a part of your story and maybe you can dive into it. I know specifically you had uh, some thoughts on how to meet really important people who might, you know, be above your status level, right? Because that's ultimately what we want to teach people how to do here today is how do you go from where you're at to meeting really important people, building really valuable relationships and upping your, your social level of influence and circle and, and knowledge and contacts and all of that. But I was going to say, I know you've got a great story in how you went about building a relationship with uh, Gary Vee. And if you could use that to maybe tie in on this topic, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of things. I have a lot of people who reach out to me, ask, you know, how do I connect with a Gary Vee or a Richard Branson or those kind of things? And there's there's kind of two things that I, I pose to them first. One is, what is your why? Like, what's the why behind it? Because oftentimes I've realized that, like, I have very little desire to connect with a Richard Branson or Elon Musk. And the reason is, is because I understand that that would oftentimes be tied in ego. It would be for me to have the opportunity to take a picture with them there and or maybe name drop that I know them and those kind of things, which is not the best way um, or not the, the best reason, I guess you could say, to to reach out to somebody. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that in the dating world, there's a question, which is, would you date yourself ultimately? Uh, and in this kind of business context, would you be friends with you? I mean, to what you said, we all want to be associated with people who are allies and not liabilities. So when you look at it from that perspective, you know, what would make me interesting to to a, a Gary Vee? Now, I don't have to be like you don't have to be famous uh, to in order to connect with somebody else, but you have to be fascinating on some level or promising. And in the whole kind of context with with Gary V, I was at this event. I was speaking at this event in Vegas called Thrive a few years back. And Gary and I have kind of been in similar circles for for quite some time. Gary spoke on day one of this event. And while he was <laughs> doing his speaking engagement, I think there was two separate occasions where people ran up on stage to take a selfie with him. And Gary is just, I mean, he's a social media guy. So like he's all for that kind of stuff. But then I was at a VIP dinner on the on, on that evening after he spoke, I was at the back of the room and uh, I was with some some of the other speakers at a table and Gary walked in because uh, he was supposed to do some like closing kind of keynote for that for that final uh, or for that VIP dinner. And he was kind of walking around the room and one of the speakers I was sitting next to who's a really good friend of mine. She's like, I want to go take a, a picture with Gary. Do you want to come with me? And again, I had to catch myself because I have those desires too to like, you know, just cozy up against the other successful people and those kind of things. And I had to hold myself back and say, you know, no, I'm, I'm cool. I'm going to sit here. So she went up and she, ta she took her photo and that kind of stuff. And then about 20, 20, 25 minutes later, Gary was kind of walking around and it was around our table. And again, I didn't, I don't want to say I didn't pay him any mind. Like I, I treated him like I treat anybody else. When there was kind of a break, he looked at me and extended his hand and said, Hey, I'm Gary. And in the back of my head, I'm like, I know exactly who you are, but that's how you start relationships with anybody for that matter. The problem that a lot of people make is they put people on pedestals, like they'll run up on stage and take a selfie or they'll, you know, they'll, they'll rush whatever them in a group setting and, 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 you know, make their pitch or whatever the case may be. And the problem is, is when you put somebody on a pedestal, what you're saying unconsciously is that you're not on the same level. And if you do that, you're basically, it's not a strong foundation at all to build any kind of relationship. A lot of the quote unquote big names that I've kind of connected with over the years, again, I've tried to really treat those as genuine relationships. Like with Tim, I saw Tim, Tim Ferriss, I saw him in a bunch of different social settings a handful of times where we just kind of glanced at each other. We saw each other, but we didn't actually connect. It wasn't probably till the fourth or fifth time that we actually had a genuine kind of conversation and that kind of flourished into uh, into something more. And the same thing with Gary and the same thing with a lot of people. So that's, again, the one of the mistakes I see a lot of people make is they'll They'll put somebody on a pedestal, and it's it's one of the worst ways to to build an actual reciprocal relationship, which is ultimately what we all want. Yeah, no, that's that's a great point, and and I think you said it perfectly. And I want to just make people aware of that because I guarantee you, the people who ran up on stage and took pictures have zero chance of ever really building a, a peer to peer relationship with Gary at that point. You know, I'm not saying it's impossible, but you're you're definitely making things more difficult. And I do the same thing. Like I have an opportunity to hang out with some really amazing people and I would love to take some photos with them and post it on social media and stuff. But I intentionally don't because the moment I do that, I'm just another fanboy. Yep. Right. So just be conscious of that and be aware of that. And gosh, there was a great quote that had to do with baseball at winning uh, either getting a touchdown or something in sports. And it's basically like 
you know, act like you've like you've done it a thousand times before when you when you end up in the end zone, right? <laughs> Don't go crazy, whatever. Just hey, I, I do this all the time. It's what I do. I score touchdowns. Yeah, and it's 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 important to know. Again, it's something I still struggle with. You know, what yeah, I mean? no, like, for I, sure. I, I still get pulled to like, oh, this is why I want to do it, but then I stop myself and I'm like, what's the what's the reason why underneath all of this? Yeah. Uh, and oftentimes it's tied to ego, and that's not not the right reason. Yeah. So uh, yeah. yeah, the temptation will always be there. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Just resist. Very cool. So, I think that's a that's a great example when it when it comes to when it comes to meeting Gary. Now, you know, one of the coolest opportunities that I've had because of this podcast is just meeting a ton of amazing people, right? And sure. getting the chance to build relationships with these folks. One area that I have absolutely failed in regarding that is continuing to stay in touch with people. Mm. You know, every week it's a new guest, it's a, a new prep for a new show, and I've got my full time business that I'm focused on and, you know, raising my son and all of that stuff. And sure. as much as I think about it and would love to stay in touch as, and as valuable as it would be for me to continue to foster the relationships that were started on this show, I have not put in the effort or come up with a methodology that will allow me to do that in a genuine but efficient way, right? Like we could all do the little computerized notes from your assistant or whomever that just doesn't seem authentic. And for me, that would be more harmful than than doing good, uh, in my opinion. So I don't do that. But at the same time, I'm, I know I'm making a mistake and I need to fix it. So I don't know if you have any any words of wisdom around that. Yeah. So no, I mean, what you're quote unquote struggling with is, I think, something that a lot of us struggle with once you reach a point where you grow to a certain size of peer group and there's only so many hours in a day. With that said, I guess there's a, a few things I can uh, touch on. And one thing you touched on beautifully was uh, a lot of people, uh, there's this mis- misconception that you can have thousands of relationships and you can maintain them all. And there's a lot of people who are quote unquote connectors or super connectors or thought leaders in that relationship space that have that assumption. And I fundamentally believe that it is wrong on almost every level. There's something called Dunbar's number, which is basically we're all, I guess, limited to roughly about 150 stable social relationships. That's been proven in science, it's been proven in research, it's been proven in history. Um, Now, obviously, with tools like CRMs and social media, I mean, that enables us to grow that on some level, but we only have so much kind of mental bandwidth. So for me, the key to a strong network is subtraction and not addition. And that's really kind of my focus, first and foremost. So really doing a good job of, of prioritizing relationships uh, and being very conscious as to where you allocate your time, I think is is one of the best approaches. I almost look at it like, you know, if you're an old school kind of video gamer, like if you're playing Street Fighter back in the day, you know, and you start with like a, a 100% on the life bar. And then if you get hit, it gets down to like 90%, 80%. I treat almost every day like that, where I know if I'm sending an email out to somebody, it, there's an opportunity cost there. That means like I'm not able to invest in another relationship that I actually want to move forward. So setting boundaries and, and being cl- clear on priorities, I think are two important things. And it's something I still struggle with as well. But you alluded to check-ins and how a lot of people, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll now there's CRMs out there that says, hey, you haven't, you know, got, you haven't reached out to Josh Bazzoni in the last 60 days, like click here to send a message uh, and those kind of things. And even like LinkedIn has those those auto populated like congrats on your work adva- anniversary and those kind of things. Those are the only time you hear from those people. And to me, similar to what you said, it does more harm than good because we all have a deep desire to 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 be seen, to be understood, to be heard, to be valued, to be appreciated. When somebody, you know, does a, a simple kind of LinkedIn you know, well, they click a button and it says, congrats on your work anniversary. And that's the exact same message they sent you last year and the year prior. That doesn't do any any good for a relationship. Yeah. You, well, you know, the worst to me, like the nuclear bomb to me is when I get an email. It's like, hey, Mike, you know, I've just been thinking about you. I wanted to see how everything's going in your life. would love to connect again. You know, let's uh, let's schedule a time to talk or whatever. And I scroll down on the email and there's an unsubscribe link oh my. <laughs> because it was an autoresponder to their entire Rolodex. Right. I'm just like, hey, you, you know, done. They're like, no. Yeah, 100 percent. Absolutely. And I, I think so. I think the check ins are valuable when there's context. And that's where a lot of people make the mistake. I mean, you're a busy individual and I get those emails sometimes, too, that aren't even on like a, a newsletter type model, but an actual genuine email that they wrote where it's like, Hey, what are you up to nowadays? And I'm like, well, check out social media. Like it's all there. Like now I'm not going to spend half an hour kind of regurgitating a lot of the stuff that can be found publicly, but the, so con- 
context matters, I think. And one thing that I do is I'm always there's there's I guess this this thing of like in sales, like the ABCs always be closing. I always think of it from a I guess a relationship perspective, always be collecting and curating and also capturing details on people. So collecting is like who are some interesting people that you should kind of maybe connect with in the in the near future. So if I come across a really interesting article or those kind of things, I'll I'll basically capture those people in like a CRM. So if I find myself in Austin, I'll I'll reach out to them or or what have you. So I'm always collecting people. I'm always curating my peer group because again, you only have so much bandwidth. And I'm always capturing details on people. So, you know, I, for example, I have a friend of mine who's having a child uh, in June. So I capture that. And what I'll do is I'll send, I'll, I'll set up in advance a, an email to go out to him, you know, maybe in July and say like, how's fatherhood treating you? Or, you know, I have a friend who's trying to raise money right now for, 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 for his business and they're hoping to close in like April. So I may send an email a few weeks prior to that saying like, how's it, how's, you know, the raising of finances coming, those kind of things. So I always try to make that, that those follow-ups contextual and that is, it, it changes the vibe of the conversation a lot. Another thing that I do do, which actually I started implementing probably a couple of months ago and it's been working exceptionally well as a way to foster or plant the seeds for new relationships and also help you, I guess, reinforce existing relationships is if I'm in conversation with somebody. So let's say we bring up like Ryan Holiday or what have you. Then what I can do is after, and Ryan is somebody that we both know, I can probably send an email out to Ryan and say, Hey, you know, just had a, a great conversation with Mike Dillard. We brought you up on the podcast, you know, hope all is well, or something along those lines. Sometimes I'll, I'll put a little more kind of context to it, but I also say no reply required at the bottom. So I just want to ping people to let them know that I'm thinking of them or, you know, that they came up in conversation because we all have a deep desire to feel significant and to feel, again, valued and, and those kind of things. And sometimes just a ping saying, hey, just thinking of you, your name came up in conversation, hope all is well, can be just a great way to just make these micro investments in relationships. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. What would be your advice to those who are listening here today that are kind of up and coming Maybe they have their own podcast or show they want to start and they want to, they want to secure the best, you know, guests that they can, right? People who are at this point out of their peer group, but that they would love to meet. If you don't have a ton of equity to offer someone, right? Like, Hey, I don't have a big audience to put you in front of on my show or something like that. How would you suggest going about starting those relationships? Well, definitely, I think the the mistake a lot of people make uh, is they have a, they're very short sighted when it comes to relationships. So very much play the the long game. Uh, I mean, in the the context of the conversation we just talked about with Gary V, I mean, I've had many opportunities to try to get on Gary V's kind of radar, but it wasn't until just the right time kind of presented itself where we were actually kind of able to connect on a on a genuine level. So it's easy to to want to rush relationships. So very much kind of play a long game because it's it's easy to make a bad first impression. And oftentimes you won't you know have a second chance oftentimes because first impressions are, are really kind of crucial. Um, so that's the first thing is, is don't really don't really rush it. With that said, I mean, one of the things that has worked for me is being transparent. I'll give you an example of this. So I my first business was a lawn cutting business back in what well, I don't know, it was like probably 10 or 12. And I did 500 of these flyers and I hand delivered all these flyers to all these houses about, you know, shoveling snow and lawn cutting. I got zero zero responses out of 450 flyers. And then the last 50 flyers, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write a handwritten note at the bottom of every single one of these mess, these, uh, these flyers and say, hey, I'm a you know 12-year-old kid looking to like you know be of service to people in the community, those kind of things. And I hand delivered those last 50. And from those 50, I had like six or seven responses. And it made me realize early on the importance of being transparent and not this like posturing that you see a lot of in the business space of like, oh, this is how big my business is or those kind of things. But if you actually transparent and, and open to be vulnerable in your outreach saying like, Hey, this is where I am. This is where I'm going. Somebody who's, you know, quote unquote successful, whether it be you or anybody for that matter, you know, we've all been there. We all started from, from, you know, trying to get our first client and those, those kind of things. Um, and oftentimes we could see ourselves in those, 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 uh, those people who are reaching out, who are basically promising 
I mean, that's that's uh, another important factor to note is this, again, not let go of the whole posturing. And, and sometimes transparency is one of the best ways to to break into a, 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 at least a conversation, if not a, a new relationship. Because all of us, especially as we get kind of more and more successful, there's a saying from Zig Ziglar that we go from survival sustainability, sustainability to success, and then success to significance. Once you reach a point where you have, you know, more than enough money to meet all your wants and needs financially, you start climbing up Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you start asking yourself, well, you know, how can I bring meaning to my life and how can I bring fulfillment? And oftentimes that stems from sell- sending the elevator back down, right? Helping other people. So uh, if somebody raises their hand and they're promising and they're willing to put in the hard work and they're transparent about where they are and where they want to go, I mean, that's more than enough for me to oftentimes want to invest in somebody. But as far as let's say we're using the example of like a podcaster starting to pod, uh, start trying to start a podcast, there's a couple of things I, w- I would say. One is again, take the long term approach. Ryan Holiday has a fantastic book called Perennial Seller, which is all about in a marketplace where everybody's trying to like you know hit New York Times for a week or have this blip on Amazon in some obscure category to call, to consider themselves a, a, a bestseller. Focus more instead of 80% of your effort on marketing and 20% of your effort on the product, focus 80% of your effort on the product and 20% of your effort on the, on the marketing. And ultimately, you know, if the product's good, it'll grow organically o- over time through word of mouth. And I, with starting a podcast, it's it's kind of the, the, the same thing where, again, everybody wants to get the big names right out of the gate. But truth of the matter is you're, you're getting better. You're honing your craft. Uh, and to me, having a bad, I'd rather have no first impression than have a bad first impression. So if I have a big name guest on the first couple episodes of my podcast, it's not going to be my best, my best work. So I much rather delay that and have them as a guest, you know, a year from now or two years from now. So really have that, that long game approach. But there's really two things that I did with mastermind talks get that can be applied kind of in a pro- podcast. One is to secure a big name out of the gate. So there's a saying that sometimes it's easier to pick up a 10 if you're in the dating world than it is to pick up four eights. So if you focus all your energy on trying to get one big name, once you have that first big name, it makes everything else significantly easier. And that's, again, along the lines of the whole anchor tenant philosophy I talked about before. And then the other philosophy is working up the food chain, which is actually something I got from Ryan Holiday and his book, Trust Me, I'm Lying. He did a great book trailer where basically they talk about how you have a story that you want to get into big media. Basically, you take that story, you offer it as an exclusive to like a small blog. And then uh, once that blog publishes the the article, then you take that link and anonymously send an email to a bigger blog and a bigger blog and then a me- news media outlet until your story becomes the story. So in the context of like, let's say you're trying to connect with or you're trying to have a great roster of, of podcast guests, if you have 10 of your 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 ideal guests, basically, and you have them all lined up, you'd reach out first to the person who's the easiest to 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 get or who is most likely to get you, give you a yes. And then once you get them, you do that interview and you hit it out of the park. Then you do the second one and the third one until you work all the way up the food chain. To By the time you get to the Richard Bransons of the world, you can point to them at the social proof. They've done the hard work and a lot of, you know, you've had a lot of people before them. I remember when I actually, I had a podcast before where I interviewed Seth Godin. And I wanted to, I already somewhat knew him before uh, I reached out to him to interview him, but he said, I'd love to do the interview, but reach out to me again in a year because I was still very early in the, in the podcasting space. And I'm actually grateful that he made me wait for that because a year later, it was a significantly better podcast interview because I was much more, I've had, I had so many other ones under my belt. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. One of the biggest suggestions that I could, I could share for new folks as well is the method that I used 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I was first getting started. And I went to my very first entrepreneur event, which was Yannick Silver's underground (laughs) events. I went to this, so I went to the second one and I had, you know, just published my ebook. I was selling something online for the very first time. And I was, I was the starstruck kid right at that event. Oh my God, there's Yannick. Oh my God, there's Jeff Walker. Oh my God, there's Frank Kern and, you know, Eben and all of these other guys that were, that were, you know, the gorillas in that industry at the time. And, you know, I had that desire to go meet them and build a relationship with them and get to know those guys. And so the instinct that I had, which was how would I like to be approached, which was to essentially send them a really genuine thank you for how they had impacted my life in a positive Mm way. So I went home and I sent Yannick, uh, or maybe it was before the event. Yeah, it was before the event. I sent Yannick just a thank you email. 
hey, here's what I learned from you. I'm really grateful. Here's how my life has benefited, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that was it. There's no ask involved. It didn't say, hey, thanks by, you know, so much. And by the way, will you do this for me? <laughs> it was just pure gratitude. And that was it. And uh, so when I went up to, to meet him and shake his hand at the event uh, and he recognized my name, he's like, oh, man, thank you so much for that letter. That was awesome. You know, would you like to consider joining our mastermind group? We're going to, you know, have applications tomorrow. And then boom, that was my, my in and I joined Yonick's mastermind group and we've been, you know, genuine best buddies for a <laughs> decade now, right? And I did the same thing with Jeff Walker and probably Frank as well, which is uh, definitely with Eben, which is just to send these folks a thank you note with nothing else attached, no other agenda. And then, you know, a few weeks later, a month later, send something else, another nice note, right? Hey, by the way, your last video on XYZ was amazing. Thanks so much. And if you start to pop into somebody's life or feed, however you choose to do that throughout whatever channel, and you're the one saying really positive stuff, you're remembered. You're, you're not the other, you know, troll who left some, some crappy comment. You're the one who's really giving positive feedback and you stand out. And I've built a lot of relationships with, uh, people, you know, who started as students of mine who, are now I just consider friends. You know, even if they're virtual online friends, if they hit me up on Facebook, I answer them, I respond to them. So that's been the most effective way that I've I've used to to build relationships with people that, you know, I wanted to uh you know to escalate my my social chain, if you will. So I I will just say, yeah, so the gift of gratitude is a fantastic way of investing in relationships. And and some of the things that you pointed out, which I think are spot on, one is it's a genuine kind of outreach which is specific. And I think that's a, a key thing as well, is that oftentimes the the success of your outreach will be in direct proportion to the amount of effort you put into it. So if you just send a, th a, a thank you email to Yannick and say, hey, you know, it's, it was nice to, to meet you or I'm a huge fan of yours and that's it. I mean, it'll have some effect, but if you say, hey, Yannick, huge fan of yours and these are the reasons why, or like you said with like Jeff Walker in the videos, and you were very specific, the more specific, the better. And I know for me, like I wrote a book, I know any author friend of mine, if you go in and say, like, I love this principle from your book on page whatever, uh, X, Y, Z, you know, thank you so much. I mean, you have my full attention. So the fact that it's genuine, specific, uh, and then also the fact that there's no ulterior motives behind it and there's no expectations around it, I think is those are like the three keys uh, that you hit on when it comes to uh, showing appreciation and, and the gift of gratitude. Yeah, and on that topic, here's a way to really screw things up, <laughs> which which just <laughs> happened to me the other day. You know, some young guy sent me a message on Instagram, and he's uh, he's like, "Hey, I love the podcast. I really need some help with my branding. Can you help me?" And that's a big ask, sure, right? Like, I'm a busy dude, and I don't know who you are, and now you want me to like just jump on a call for free and you know coach you or whatever. And so my response was, you know, well, have you checked out you know Self Made Man yet? And he was like, yeah, but it just seems kind of not specific enough or I don't know if I want to spend the money on it. <laughs> and it's $19, right? <laughs> so, so instantly I'm like, no, like definitely not. You, you won't even spend 19 bucks and now you want my time for free. And so if you're going to reach out to someone and if you, you have an ask, you better make sure that you've read their book, that you've done your homework, ideally that you're a customer of theirs. Because if not, it's just a huge turnoff. And now you've put yourself in, you know, the position of essentially a moocher rather than a genuine, a genuine fan and a customer and, and someone who deserves time and, and attention, right? So just be mindful of that when you reach out to folks. I remember Ryan Holiday told me a story where he lives just outside of Austin, as I'm sure you know, and he had somebody who flew halfway around the world to show up at his house to meet him. And had some specific, some questions around certain things. And Ryan ended up giving him like 10 minutes of his time. But he's like, those three things that he asked were found in blog posts that I wrote. And he could have saved the trip from, you know, the flight from halfway around the world to do it. So, yeah, I mean, especially if, if the information's already out there and they haven't done the research. And also, if you packaged it in, you know, it's $19. I mean, what a, what a steal. Yeah, I, I, I laugh. I hear those stories all the time. Yeah, awesome. All right. So, I want to transition a little bit here because we've got about 10 minutes left. Sure. From an events perspective, you guys have Mastermind Talks once a year. I've got a couple of questions around that. First, could you tell us a little bit about the format, how people can attend, what the pricing is from a customer's perspective? But then I would love to get a little bit of insight from you on the business model around that because we've put up on the whiteboard, right, for year two, year three of, of Self Made Man of either doing a genuine Mastermind Talk as you would normally you know, see them with 12 to 18 people 
Mm -hmm. Or should we go with a much, uh, you know, more accessible event at a a much lower price point with a thousand people? Yeah. Uh, Your insight and feedback would just be unbelievably valuable, not only to myself, but anyone else out there who has an audience who might be wondering if they should implement the same type of offering in their business model. Yeah. So I could tell, yeah, I could basically tell you, I guess, our mindset going into it on what the evolution of, of MMT, because it's a, it's a rather unique and unconventional approach to events. So basically, initially when we started, uh, because I was so jaded from my last company where, you know, I, you being in e-commerce, you can't really choose who you get to serve ultimately. When it came to MMT, I knew I only want to serve people that I could genuinely care about. And that to me was important. And I didn't want to do an event where I didn't know certain people by name. Ultimately, I want to not only know their name, but the name of their spouse, the name of their kids, what their business is, what keeps them up at night, where they where they are and where they want to go ultimately in business and in life. So uh, that deep level of intimacy was important to me. So our model was uh, application only. In our first event, we had 4,200 entrepreneurs apply for the 150 spots. And I didn't know if that level of curation would pay off. I mean, our process before was look at applications, those that we were thought were the right fit, send them an invitation. And when they secured an invitation, do a phone call with them. And on that phone call, I try to assess if they were the right fit for the community. And uh, ultimately, and I've been, I belong to groups like EO or YPO, where your business uh, has to do a certain amount of kind of financial revenue in order to be accepted. But that's the only barrier to entry. And I know some people with $100 million businesses that I wouldn't want to have coffee with because their, you know, their priorities are in shambles. So for me, the, the vetting process uh, when considering somebody for MMT early on was would I want to have dinner with this person? And if the answer was no, I didn't care how successful they were financially. I wouldn't allow them into the event. And I refunded, I think, $48,000 in paid tickets for that first event using that model. And ultimately, that curation turned out to be what made us so kind of successful out of the gate. I mean, when we had our first event, we had 15 speakers. They all stayed the entire duration of the event, which was very different than most events where speakers come from behind a set of curtains, do their talk, and then leave. Mm -hmm, Uh, And then also we had 15 speakers. 10 of them came back as paid attendees the following year. Mm -hmm. And many of them are still part of our community going six years now. And again, it's because of that, that curation. Now, when it comes to scale, which is something we all kind of think about on some level, when you have success in the event industry, the common strategy strategy to scale is more events or bigger events. What makes MMT unique is the intimacy. So instead of scaling in size every year, we scale by raising the caliber of people in attendance. So just because you were invited last year doesn't mean that you're necessarily invited back. And we scale the price or uh, we raise the price every year. Now, initially, when I got into the event space, I had no experience whatsoever. So I reached out to a few friends of mine who were who had experience in events. I said, how much could I get for an event like this? And the majority have said like a thousand bucks at most. So I decided to start charging nine ninety five. And then because we had such a high demand, you know, with the forty two hundred applications, I decided to send a hundred of those people to a higher price point as a simple A B test to see, you know, what would happen. And the second price point was thirty three ninety seven for the exact same ticket. We had just as many people sign up at that price point from a ratio perspective, but they are better quality people, which is what we were looking for since the beginning. So that's how we became a high price point event. So we went from 1,000 to 3,000 to 4,500 to 7,500 to 10,000. Now we're 12,500. So that's been the model. Now I think we're probably going to cap out around that 12,500 because I realized there was a little bit of ego into like the pricing model where I was like, well, we can raise the price every year and, and, you know, people, our conversion rate on invites is like 81%. But yeah, I think I don't want to start kind of, you know, I don't want people to, to I, there's certain people in our community that I want to keep and I don't want to outprice them basically. Right. So, cause a lot of people who come to MMT are jaded by events. They don't go to other events anymore. They don't really belong to any other communities. MMT is kind of like the main one. So that's been our, our kind of evolution. And as far as the format is concerned, it's rather unique as, as well, because when we started our first event, we want to be like the Ted talks for entrepreneurs. And again, we did that, that, that competition model. The cool thing actually about that competition model was we had some really big name speakers speak year one. Uh, I mentioned some of them before, but we had Ted speakers and just a fascinating group of individuals. The best thing that happened was the first place winner, second place winner, and the four people tied for third. None of them were the big names. The big name draws were like eighth, ninth, 14th place. And that happened again in year two and that happened again in year three. So we kind of, we kind of demonstrated without knowing it that the big name speakers don't always deliver the most amount of value. 
And then when looking at that first event, we crammed like 12 speakers in one day. I have a strong desire to over deliver, which like oftentimes that shows up as me trying to cram as much content when I'm doing a workshop or cram as many speakers as I can when doing an event. And I remember just watching body language. I can't sit straight for seven minutes, let alone listen to seven speakers back to back. So because of that, I realized kind of early on that people were coming to the event for content, but what was bringing them back year over year was community. So we really start to shift the model. And when we did our event in year four, we sold out four months in advance without announcing any speakers or any agenda. And at that point, it became very clear to me that people are coming for the quality of people more than anything else. So at that year, when people showed up at the event, we said, surprise, we actually don't have any speakers. We're moving to a peer-to-peer model. And what that model looks like from a content perspective is is we do these peer-to-peer roundtables. We'll have five of these roundtables running simultaneously with somebody in the community facilitating a discussion. So it may be Tucker Max on how to become a New York Times bestselling author or Ryan Holiday on maybe the writing process or you know, it could be Tim Ferriss on podcasting or, or those kind of things. So basically, you, you can kind of choose your own adventure because I think it's it's silly to have the, the type of people that we cater to, to invest four or five days out of their calendar to listen to a speaker passively speak from a stage when they could consume that content listening to a podcast on the way to the gym or on the way to the office makes very little sense for them. So instead, we, we to me, the best learning doesn't always happen in a conference room. It happens over the bar after dinner or happens over yoga in the morning or those kind of things. So we try to to really create space in our three days together uh, and make it very experiential. And then from a content learning perspective, it's very much a choose your own adventure. And it's based on that peer to peer model. And I mean, it's worked for us. I mean, our last sort of two events ago, our approval rating was 9.71 out of 10. Wow. Our last event was 9.90 out of 10. That's a big sexy number to throw around. Truth is, it scares the crap out of me <laughs> when it comes to like planning next year's event, because, well, you know, every time you raise that bar, it becomes just expected the following year, yeah. which is why we only do one event a year is I need that space. I need those 362 days to figure out, you know, how can we refine this? So that's fundamentally why we don't do an event every three months. It's because we we all want to consistently raise the bar. And thankfully, we've been able to do that. But again, we have a schedule that in- includes a lot of space, uh, a lot of kind of community focus, and a lot of peer to peer type uh, experiences. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, very cool. I'm just sitting there trying to picture it in my head. I love the format. I love <laughs> the uh, the approach that you're taking on that because I'm the same way. If I go to an event, I'm walking in and out all the time because I just I don't want to sit in a chair for <laughs> for eight hours. Sure, and and watch somebody speak from stage. And so I really love the collaboration component and and the fact that you get to talk to experts on a topic and ask your questions and and get down into the nitty gritty stuff. Which you know I've always said success is in the details. And so to have an opportunity to dive into details with experts like that is awesome. And you value relationships. Like you, you probably see the world the same way I do when I was at a workshop recently and it was like a how to for two days. And at the end of this two days, I'm like, why am I here? I don't need to know how I need to know who, who do I need to hire or who do yeah. I need to meet that will implement this or who's the expert in this space? So yeah, I, I think that's a, a really important factor. So I always try to find myself in environments with people who are, you know, the leaders in their space or, or what have you. Yeah, no, agree. That's, and that's, that goes back to the beginning, right? Two ways, new information, new people. <laughs> so, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, that's awesome. Well, Jason, where can people go to connect with you to uh, potentially apply for the next event coming up and, uh, and plug into your work? Yeah. So, uh, well, with Mastermind Talks, the, the best way to be considered is by being nominated through somebody in the community. Uh, truth be told, our applications just go into this blank void. <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't do anything with them. So, yeah, if you know somebody who's been a part of MMT, uh, that's the best way to be considered. Other ways, I'm on Twitter at Jason Gaynard. I have a podcast called Community Made, which uh, every season is themed. The first season was all about scale. The second season is all about relationships. Um, so that's another way to, 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 I guess, hear more from me. But that's that's my life, MMT and the podcast. That's awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much for the time today. It's been a pleasure to finally get to connect after all these years. And, uh, man, we've, uh, I think, dropped a lot of really valuable lessons here for folks that, that you've learned the hard way during your career. And, and I love the fact that you're willing to share your story. I love stories that entrepreneurs go through when they essentially hit the abyss point, right? And you, you, you're the second guest in this month to, to bring up the bankruptcy, <laughs> you know, the bankruptcy piece. Keith Cunningham shared his story uh, oh. two weeks ago and the fact that he was 40 and filed for bankruptcy and had to start over from scratch. And 
I just always find that really valuable because when I was getting my start as an entrepreneur, everybody just talked about their success stories and how much money they were making and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And now, you know, over the last 10 years, it's changed. And I think uh, a lot of us who've had challenges kind of are happy to show off our battle scars and what we've been through. Um, and I think that's really valuable for folks who are, who are up and coming and going through challenges. So thanks very much for that. Awesome. And well, listen, I'm a huge fan of who you are, what you stand for and, and, and the podcast. I mean, I didn't listen to the Keith Cunningham episode yet. I didn't know if it, I didn't know it was out, but I'm going to check it out because Keith is awesome. And that's the one thing I love about you is you go after unconventional guests who are kind of uh, diamonds in the rough, uh, who are fascinating people like Jeff, uh, Josh Bazzoni. I've never heard him on any other podcast. That was one of my favorite podcasts I've listened to on any platform. That yeah. interview was amazing. We're top five we've ever had for sure. And, and if y'all are, if y'all are still jonesing for uh, another episode right now, make sure you go back. It was probably in the first 50 episodes and listen to yep. the Josh Bazzoni episode. It was unbelievably valuable so that's yeah he shared he shared a framework on hire how to hire an executive team which i that's the reason i've shared that episode with so many people it was brilliant so oh, yeah cool. congrats on on the work that you do it's it's important and it's a uh, it's an honor to be on oh thank you brother well guys uh gals thank you so much as always for listening and connect with jason make sure you get his name right it's j-a-y-s-o-n <laughs> Um, just thought I'd, just thought I'd throw that in there for clarification. <laughs> and um, as always, thank you so much for listening and for your support of the show. Check out the new selfmademan.com platform as well. We've got the entire podcast archive there. This one will be available up there uh, as soon as it's published and Josh's can be found there also. Uh, so we'll see you next week. Take care.